we'll start with an opening comments from the commissioner and then we'll take questions. Uh, please, uh, Nate, raise your hand. We'll bring a microphone to you and we'll do name and affiliation, please. All right, Adam. Thank you, Tim. Uh, we just finished two days of productive meetings here at the St. Regis Hotel with our Board of Governors. Um, we spoke a fair amount about the state of the game and the terrific level of competition. Uh, Joe Dumars, our uh, head of basketball operations, made a presentation. Of course, he's been successful at every level of the game, been around the game for 40 years. And in his view, this is a golden era of the NBA. He's, as, as Joe said, he doesn't remember a time when there was so, so much talent, so many great players on the floor. So that was wonderful to hear. We talked a fair amount about the new player participation policy this year, which um, has you know been discussed a lot throughout the year, the, the 65 um, game uh, threshold for uh, being able to be eligible for certain awards. I think the view in the room was that it's working. I mean, in fact, um, there was a presentation on star player um, uh, participation this year. And in fact, um, games missed by star players is down roughly 15% uh, in the regular season this year. So good news there. Um, it's Andre Iguodala, the executive director of the Players Association. And, and I have talked a fair amount of, um, along the way this year. Obviously, issues have come up around particular players. And what we said is when we get to the end of the season, of course, we always sit down and talk with our Players Association to see what makes sense. But at least uh, the sentiment in the room from the teams is that, in fact, is, it is working as intended. Um, from a business side, we're now going to as we finish out the regular season, once a game set, once again set an attendance record. It'll be the highest attendance in, in the history of this league. So compliments to um, our teams and, of course, the fans, who sort of are are rewarding uh, our these or, these organizations by showing up and 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 enjoying the competition. And uh, that that's wonderful to see. Um, from a media standpoint, talked a fair amount about the environment right now in which we're negotiating. So I think everyone is aware we are in now an exclusive negotiating period with our two major partners, uh, the Disney company, ABC and ESPN on one hand, and Warner Brothers Discovery, which is, which is TNT. And the report from me is that the conversations are, are ongoing and have been very positive. Um, I just lastly say before opening up to questions, um, it, it's wonderful to see the enormous interest in basketball right now, not just at the professional level, but at the collegiate level, men's and women's. Um, you know, based on our data um, on, on a global basis, basketball is the fastest growing sport in the world right now. Um, you know, again, WNBA now going into its 28th season. Um, credit to David Stern, Val Ackerman, and others who um, were promoting the women's game, you know, almost three decades ago now on the professional level. But I, we all saw, I think everyone has taken notice, notice of, of Caitlin Clark and uh, her fantastic success in that University of Iowa program. Of course, congratulations to the University of South Carolina and Don Staley, a WNBA alum. Um, it, clearly, the public has taken note of the women's game. Record, rec record ratings, as again, as you all know, you know, highest rated basketball game of any sort, professional, collegiate, in the last five years. I think it's just fantastic for the game. Uh, I, and, and not just young girls, but young boys too. Um, it's our view that by watching great competition, young people are then inspired to play this game at every level. Um, that's what we're seeing in our participation numbers. Basketball continues to be largest team participation sport in the United States, and those numbers continue to grow. So we're, we're very much buoyed by that. Of course, um, lastly, our regular season is about to come to an end this weekend. Play-in tournament will be starting next Tuesday, and then the playoffs next weekend. And WNBA draft, Monday, 7.30 on ESPN. Stay tuned. So uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you all for being here today. All right, we'll start second row on your left on the end, Brian. And Brian Mahoney, Associated Press. Adam, uh, <clears throat> last night there was an NBA game with historically low foul total, uh, Milwaukee and Boston. Doc Rivers said afterward, you would be happy about that. Um, there has been at least some wonder if 
the league made any sort of directives or guidance on calling less fouls in the second half of the year? Can you sort of explain that that's true? And if there's any concern on your part that the playoffs are about to start and maybe teams are sort of unsure the way the game is going now? Well, I just to answer the last part of your question, Brian, um, as I mentioned earlier, just coming out of two, media, two days of meetings with our teams, our teams are very happy with the state of the game, as am I. And as I said, I think we're seeing fantastic competition on the court. To your specific question, first of all, last night, uh, obviously an anomaly. But when you look at the data for the season, it's true that as the season went on, foul calls came down um, r roughly, you know, two, four, two fouls per team per game. That's, that's what we're looking at, just to put it in context. You know, r r roughly two fouls per team per game. And as we've said now along the way, you know, Brian's, Byron Spruell is here, head of basketball operations. Joe Dumars are constantly meeting with the competition committee. I participate in that meeting. And we get feedback from our teams, and we calibrate as we go in terms of how people view the game. I think there was a sense earlier in the season that um, – there was too much of an advantage for the offensive players, you know, whether I think Steve Kerr said offensive players were using themselves as projectiles or, you know, hunting for fouls, however you want to call it. And so that was a point of emphasis on, on behalf of the league. You know, we were transparent with our teams about that. Again, everyone can see what's happening on the floor and make their own judgments about the calls being made. But um, so, yes, you know, there was a bit of an adjustment made along the way. Um, but again, the context is two fouls per team per game. And the end result, most importantly, we think is a better game. And I think that now, despite what some people say, I mean, we don't measure success by the number of points scored, certainly. It's, it's all about competition. And I think that if, if you look now at sort of what we're hearing from our fans, I think the fans want to see great offense, but they want players to be allowed to play defense as well. And I think. And I think that's what we're seeing. And I, so I'm, I'm very happy with the state of the game. And I'm, I'm, my expectation is we move into the playoffs, we're going to continue to see a great competition. Third row in the middle, Tanya. Tanya Ganguly, New York Times. Um, where do things stand with the situation with the sale of the Timberwolves? And is, at what point would the league get involved with that? It, it, it's not clear whether there will be a role for the league to get involved. Where it stands is... Uh, Glenn Taylor on one hand as the seller of the franchise and then with Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez as, as the buyers, they have a purchase agreement and there's a dispute now in the purchase agreement and in their purchase agreement, they in essence pre-agreed to a dispute resolution mechanism that includes mediation and arbitration and that's where it stands. There is no role for the league in that process. All right, right next to Tanya, Vinny. Hey, hey Adam, uh, Vince Goodwill, Yahoo Sports. Uh, where do things stand with the Jonte Porter investigation? Do, and also, similarly, do you have concerns about with the increased relationship that the NBA and Professional Sports League have with gambling as a whole, that this is something that, that will increasingly become an issue? Well, I, I always have concern if to the extent that there's inappropriate behavior or in alleged inappropriate behavior um, by any participant in our game, particularly around gambling. Um, there is an ongoing investigation of John Tay Porter. Just I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I think to your larger question, um, you know, it's we, the league, I mean, we stated our position before even the Supreme Court overturned the federal act that largely made um, sports betting illegal and, and, and our position from the beginning is that this should be a regulated industry in the United States. Um, my, my personal preference, rather than dealing with the state-by-state -state, um, laws, which is what we now are, are, are dealing with, it, there should be consistent federal legislation um, nationally. But I, I think there is a, a, a proper role for regulation here in determining the amount of marketing, frankly, the kinds of bets um, that can be placed on our games. Um, I'm not against it, I, you know, in terms of legalized sports betting, because I think the alternative is illegal sports betting. And I think at least in a legalized um, structure, there there's transparency. Be, and, and just as in cases we've dealt with where very sophisticated computers, when there's aberrational behavior, um, you become aware of that, as opposed to betting that takes place in the shadows or underground. So. 
those are really our two choices. You can't turn the clock back. There's especially once sports betting became prevalent on the internet and we all knew before it was legalized that a, a lot of it was going on. You saw it all over the place. So again, legalized jurisdiction from my standpoint is better, but we're learning a lot about this industry, the impact of marketing on fans, on activity in our arenas. We've heard those stories that of players and coaches of, you know, it's, that's not anything new, it, it, but it, 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 anecdotally at least, it's increasing in terms of fans yelling out at players about over-unders and yelling at coaches about playing players and fans disappointed about spreads not um, being covered. I, I, again, I think we, we, we all have to address that as an industry, including the gaming companies, and decide where the proper lines are. And I think there is a role, again, for the government here in terms of proper regulation, even around the amount of marketing. We limit the amount of sports betting advertising in our games, whether that's at the right line, you know, uh, others may have a different opinion, but we limit it. But that's just a fraction, of, of course, of the amount of sports betting advertising we see. I live in the New York market. It's constant in terms of, uh, of promotions for people to bet on sports. I worry also about young people. I mean, it's, it's, of course, illegal for young people to bet in sports. Maybe that makes my point, but somehow they still find a way to do it. You hear those stories anecdotally as well. And so whether there need to be greater safeguards is something we have to look at. But at the end of the day, nothing, there's nothing more important than the integrity of the competition. Um, and so any issue raised around that is of I know, great concern to me and to all commissioners, to all people who are safeguarded, who, who, all people are in a position and, and have a responsibility to safeguard the game. So it's, I, again, this is, this is a burgeoning industry in the United States. Um, it's been legal in other places in the world uh, for decades. There's lessons to be learned from the way that sports betting is, is monitored and regulated in other jurisdictions. And again, I think as, as, as these unfortunate examples come along, um, we may have to adjust our rules and our, our partner gaming companies and those companies that aren't our partners may have to adjust their behavior as well. Second row on the right, two in, Eben. Hey, Eben from Sportico. Um, two quick Timberwolves questions. Um, one, Alex and Mark have said that the only thing holding up their deal was NBA approval of the financing and, and the money. Can you clarify or confirm exactly where that stood when Glenn announced that the deal, in his view, was off? I, I, I can't say more other than that comment is at the heart of their dispute. You know, and again, it, the, the, the dispute is, to, is precisely that, as to whether um, they had acted within the window that, of the option that, that Grant, that Glenn Taylor had sold them. I mean, that, that's the very basis of the dispute. And so that dispute will be resolved independent of the league office. Got it. And then secondly, this was an atypical deal from the outset. They had not raised the money. Glenn wanted three years path to control. Is this a deal structure the NBA would approve in the future? Or is it, does this necessitate a rethink about what, what types of structures allow you to buy NBA teams moving forward? Is it, that's an important question. I, I think this deal happened in the early days of the pandemic um, when um, it was extraordinary circumstances, I think, for everyone um, in, in our community. Um, it, it, I think lessons learned, too, that as new situations evolve in the league as to what kind of transactions make sense, I think let's, let's wait to see um, how this one works out. But it's, it's certainly not ideal to have a stepped transaction like this. I mean, it, it, it met our rules from that standpoint. Um, but, but, you know, and, and it's what Glenn Taylor wanted and it's what they were willing to agree to at the time. But I think once the dust clears, you know, on this deal, it may cause us to, to reassess um, what sort of transactions we should allow. Second row on the right on the end, Randall. Hey, Adam. Randall Williams, Bloomberg News. I'm wondering, uh, or you've said that uh, the conversations around expansion will happen after the NBA media deal completes. I wonder what that process is going to look like. I think fans want to know there's a lot of cities out there, Vegas, Seattle, Nashville, maybe Mexico City, that feel like they're prime candidates. What from the, the league office is that going to look like? We haven't set that process yet, but just based on historical precedent, um, Generally, we formed a committee of our governors 
often it's either an expansion committee or sometimes an existing committee takes jurisdiction of the process. But one of our goals is to be very clear and transparent because we've received inquiries from many different potential buyers in many different cities. And I just want to make sure everyone feels fairly treated here. And it's why I've gone out of my way when I'm asked to say, this is only on one track. There aren't private conversations happening right now. No one has an inside track to getting a deal done that at the time we will, with our committee, look at the cities that are interested, um, talk to the groups that are interested, and then go from there. But um, it's, we, we, we've really drawn a, a bright line here to say to potential interested parties, thank you, but we're not ready to start that process yet. As you said in your question, we do think it's important that we finish this set of media deals, in part so that any possible potential buyer, um, and we understand what the economics are, so nobody's guessing as to what the, which, and media is our most important form of revenue, so then that will be known as, they're, as we're assessing what the value is of a potential expansion team. Third row on the right on the end, Mike. Yeah, Adam, uh, Mike hey, Workinoff <clears throat> with The Athletic. Um, obviously, now that you're in the, the, nego the exclusive negotiating window with the media rights deal, um, how important is it for the health of the league going forward to get a number that you're happy and you're comfortable with uh, you know, for the revenue for the league, for expansion, for franchise valuations going forward to get something and the land that in the spot that can kind of keep the NBA moving forward? Well, you know, of, of course it's important to keep growing, but then regardless of what I'd like to happen or, or I want to see, there's then a market for these, for these rights. And th what will largely determine the value is what the market looks like. And so, well, I think the market is robust right now. I mean, just even looking outside of the NBA, um, what's happening in women's sports. I mean, again, we're, we're, we're also representing, we are the NBA and the WNBA, so we're talking about both leagues right now in terms of renewing our rights deals. We're seeing it in other sports that increasingly live premium sports is what's breaking through in media. And what's been interesting from watching what's happening in other leagues and some of the discussions we're having, you know, when you, when you think about moving from traditional television broadcast or cable or satellite to a streaming world, it opens up all kinds of possibilities. For us, being a very global league, you know, getting close to 30% of our players born outside the United States, a, a league that's distributed around the world, um, that opens up tremendous opportunity for us you know, with a potentially with a partner to be delivering those games globally. What's also fascinating to me is, you know, there's been so much discussion now about moving games from traditional television to streaming, but for the most part, what we've seen so far is in essence the same feed. You might have seen it on this network, instead it'll be available on this streaming platform. But what's happening now through um, cloud services, through artificial intelligence, uh, through all kinds of innovation around sports programming is you're now able to present the games in entirely different ways, almost unlimited permutations of, of and creating all sorts of personalization, personalization for fans. I mean, just one example, the sports betting issue comes up. If you don't want anything to do with sports betting, you won't have to have anything to do with it. It's click, click. I don't want to hear or see those ads. I don't want um, um, any optionality on seeing spreads or lines or whatever other information a sports better may want. On the other hand, somebody who is interested in sports betting is in a legal jurisdiction is of, and is of age can choose to see those fields. People are interested in buying the latest shoes that the player is wearing um, or fashion that the player wears off the floor or unlimited numbers of languages or dialects or focusing on particular players. That is what I find so incredibly exciting about what's now happening um, through this transition. And so it, there's, there's, of course, price, and that'll be negotiated, and the market will be what it is. I think just as important to us as we're talking um, to our current partners and, and seeing what's available in the marketplace is what some of these media companies will be able to do with NBA and WNBA content. How will they present it? Um, how easy will it be for fans to find it? Um, what other forms will they deliver it in? What will be the quality of the, way, uh, of the presentation? So all those things become relevant. So it's so fair question about increasing valuations, but when you look long term, um, it, it's 
money, don't get me wrong, is a big part of it, but it's also growing the sport will involve more than getting a high rights fee. It'll have to do with, it'll have a lot to do with how the game of basketball is presented to our fans globally. Third row on the left, Simone. Simone Sandri, Gazzetta dello Sport. On uh, Bronny James uh, declaring for the draft, uh, we're not sure if he's staying. Obviously, it's a very unique situation. But I wonder, uh, considering the constant narrative, are you afraid of, at all of the optics of maybe a team deciding to uh, draft a player not necessarily for his merit, but potentially maybe to uh, entice his uh, father, uh, free agent to be? I, I would only say, in fairness to the, the, the James family and Bronny, I, I don't want to comment on that. Um, I, 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 I said hello to Bronny a few times. Seems like a fine young man. I mean, obviously dealing with enormous scrutiny, had a health issue, you know, earlier in the year. So there's already enough pressure on him. But I, you know, ultimately, you know, I'll, I'll leave it to our, our teams, you know, and, and to LeBron and his family to do what's right, you know, for his, for his son and his family. Third row in the middle, back to Vinny. Hey, Adam, I think with a week left in the season, there's 13 teams between 44 wins and 49 wins. I know your predecessor loved the idea of dynasties and what that meant for marketing the league. You seem to be a bit more diplomatic. Is this kind of, I guess, by your smile, I guess this is answering the question, is this what you've envisioned, especially with the collective bargaining agreement, the second aprons that will be implemented in the coming years? Yes, I only say, you know, maybe I should have said this at the beginning that, you know, with less than a week to go, we have one team that has locked in its seat right now. Um, and, and that includes essentially 20 slots in, in, in when you build in the, the, the play-in tournament. So I'm thrilled with the level of competition. And I think what fans ultimately want is to see great competition across the league. And I only say to, as to dynasties, I'm not anti-dynasty but you want dynasties to be created to the extent possible with a level playing field. So if teams draft well, develop play, players well, trade well, but in essence operate roughly within the same number of chips, so to speak. I get it, we have a tax system, so that creates some advantages for some teams. But I think then you want to see that management skill, the, the collective activity of those players rewarded. That to me is a different kind of dynasty because then and you, you, you then can appreciate what's happening on the floor, and you don't necessarily want to set out to artificially break up a team that's been built that way. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, you know, to me, that you can never predict what's going to happen with the competition, but that what, what we set out to do, both with our collective bargaining system and, frankly, our revenue sharing system, was to give all 30 teams an opportunity to compete and if, and if well managed to be an ability to make a profit as well, because that's back to the early question about um, media financing is that that's then what allows them to reinvest in the organization, build new facilities and, and, and grow the franchise. And it's far from a perfect system now, but I think we're seeing that. And, when, and, and part of it is, said this before, a change in media consumption too, that when Victor Wembanyama goes to San Antonio, I don't hear people saying, oh, it's a small market, somehow he's not gonna have the kind of visibility, uh, no different than Giannis in Milwaukee. I, that's what I love about a true 30-team league, that players and, and teams should be judged by the quality of the team they put together and, and their success on the floor. And in this day and age, when every game is available on your phone and then every game is available globally, and as I said, it's, we'll look at our new media deals, maybe, maybe making even with more features, making that even more accessible, um, the difference in market size in a global sport will become much less relevant. And, and that will help too, you know, truly have 30 teams, but truly put 30 teams in, in a position to, to all compete for championships. Third row right next to Vinny, Tanya. Hey, Adam. Um, you know, LeBron and Steph, after all these years, are still the two guys that drive more attention than anyone else to the league. People get very excited when they play against each other, even if their teams are not as good as they have been in the past. Um, and even though there are younger players who are, you know, younger great players in the league, um, I'm curious why you think it is that those two guys have shined above, you know, everyone else still. And, and also, do you have concerns about the era of the NBA after they're done, after they retire? 
Um, I, I, I don't have concern about after they retire, because I said earlier, you know, when Joe Dumars was saying a golden era of, of, of NBA competition, it's just amazing when you look around the league at the number of great players we see out on the floor, and then we look at the pipeline of the players coming up. I would say in terms of LeBron and Steph, I think they deserve the fact that they're on a pedestal to a certain extent because of their success on the floor. I mean, in addition to being charismatic and charming and good guys, that ultimately um, multiple championships gets rewarded by fans caring about them and caring about the franchises they play for. Um, but what we're also seeing, and this goes a little bit to change in media, it's, it's I mean, as much as success as Caitlin Clark has had in the three prior seasons, she didn't break through till relatively recently as a true household name, as maybe one of the best athletes known in college sports. So stars can be also created much quicker these days than in the old days. So you have, I mean, in a way, legacy stars deserve to be in those positions. But again, with enormous social media community out there, I mean, literally in the billions for basketball, um, a global market uh, for talent that what's so cool about sports is that it's the meritocracy of, you know, at the end of the day, show us what you can do, you know, on the floor um, in the case of basketball. And so I think that talent gets rewarded. And when you're fortunate to be a league, um, you know, both the men's and women's side, where the very best in the world want to play in, in a single league, um, and there's so much basketball being played on a global basis. I just, I just think it's the stars will continue to emerge, and they're different. And you know, for those who've been around the sport long enough, um, you know, I remember when Magic retired and Larry retired and Michael retired and Kobe retired. You know, people were, oh my God, you know, and that, it's amazing. It's just that yet new and different stars end up emerging. And, you know, have their own personalities, their own styles, and then. You know, next generation of fans care as much about them as they did the players before them. Second row on the left, Brian. Adam, <coughs> sorry, um, a follow up on the port. Like, like four per customer? <laughs> or <was> like, <laughs> <laughs> I paid good money. My media rights are a lot. Sorry. A uh, follow up on the Porter uh, question. Um, first of all, you know, depending on where something like that ever led an investigation, is there a penalty that? Do you have a range of what you can do, or is there anything that is sort of in the rule book what, uh, what a penalty would be? And the second one, that story broke. A lot of people online were saying, what did they expect? Of course, something like that was going to happen at some point. I know you said you were concerned, which is why you were early on you know, wanting the regulation and such. But were you surprised? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always surprised in any in individual circumstance. If you look at the history of sports betting, um, prior to the legal, the mass legalization, it was always legal in Las Vegas, but the mass legalization of it in the United States, there have been incidents. We've had incidents, obviously, you know, with an official. I mean, this is not new, that there's unsavory behavior, even illegal behavior around sports betting. I guess my point is that to the extent it's gonna exist, that if you have a regulated environment, that you're gonna have a better chance of detecting it than you would if all the bets were placed illegally. And as to your question about the consequences, um, I have enormous uh, range um, of, of discipline available to me, but um, it's cardinal sin, you know, that, that what he's accused of in the NBA and, and the ultimate uh, extreme option I have is, you know, to ban him from the game. I mean, this is, that's the level of, uh, uh, you know, uh, of, of, authority I have here because there's nothing more serious, I think, in, you know, around this league when it comes to, you know, gambling and betting on our games, and that is a direct player involvement. And so investigation is ongoing, but, you know, the, the consequences could be very severe. All right. Thanks, Adam. Appreciate right. you all being if you, here. If you've got one get more. a few more? Okay. Well, if he, he had one more. Randall, go ahead. I was just going to ask really quickly. I believe you told the Pat McAfee show that you had no idea about Spulu, the 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 product from um, Fox, ESPN, and Warner Bros. Discovery when it was announced. I wonder what your thoughts are on it now and how that affects media negotiations. Yeah, I, I, all I said on Pat Mac McAfee show is that I had um, no prior knowledge before it was announced, and we were informed by our partners then. And I know now. I've just again that they've moved forward. They've in the process of hiring a management team. So other than that, I don't know too much more about it. 
We'll do the last one with Evan. Thanks, Adam. Yeah. Uh, the, I know there have been talks about splitting the WNBA rights away from the NBAs in, in this round of negotiations. Has a decision been made on that? And, and if not, what are the factors that lead to that decision, whether it's reading the market or their choice or your choice? How does that decision get made? Well, so, so ultimately it's a collective choice here between the NBA and the WNBA. And now if, if you look at how those rights are distributed, we share a partner of course, in the Disney company, but then there are some partners of the WNBA that are independent of the NBA. So I think what's going to happen is we, we're, we're setting out um, in these discussions, discussing both NBA and WNBA. I mean, there's no doubt, I think, especially over enormous interest, you know, most recently around women's college basketball and the growth in the WNBA over the last few years, that the interest is heightened from where it used to be. So that's wonderful to see. In the first instance, I think it's in the league's interest to the extent we can do integrated deals and the NBA promotes into the WNBA season, the WNBA promotes into the NBA, and we can all talk about basketball, I think that's a positive thing. On the other hand, there may be unique channels for the WNBA that make particular sense. There's women's sports networks, other things that may bring um, particular attention, which could be complementary um, to, to um, the, the, the coverage that they would get through a, a, a traditional media partner that the that the NBA would be part of, and also it's a function to that earlier question of the marketplace as well. I mean, I, my sense is that, we, you, just as a reminder, the NBA represents roughly 260 nights a year programming. WNBA currently is about 60 nights. That could grow over time. And to the extent we can present ourselves as a year-round basketball product, that becomes increasingly important, I think particularly to streaming platforms that are dealing with you know, potential churn. That, and, and I think it's also, I'll just end by saying one of the, what, what I mentioned before in terms of what we can do with uh, new technologies, AI, um, digital executions around our game. I think we're in the process at, at the league office, and by when I say the league office, I mean the NBA and the WNBA, of investing heavily in developing an expertise around how to produce basketball and what the best ways are to present it. So presumably, by having these integrated deals, we can take advantage of that, uh, of our expertise, of that technology in finding, you know, it, you know as, as Sabrina Unescu said, you know, at All-Star Game, you know, Basketball is basketball, shooters are shooters. You know, at the end of the day, it's the game. And to the extent that we come, we come up with ways that to, to better present the game, to um, do a better job engaging fans with an understanding of the game and what makes this player unique and what defense is really being played. And, it's, and, and when people can go beyond, it sometimes happens with the commentators that make it clear it's much more than effort. It's like, why is this player being shut down? What is this offense? you know, presented in a way that makes it even that much more enticing to fans, there's real opportunities to scale there when you, when you put the NBA and WNBA together. Great. Thank you, Adam. We'll have transcripts available on Media Central shortly. Have a great day. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank you Tim.